I don't make a lot of money as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And I tell you what, that's by God's design. Before I became a pastor, through my hand, write my check, with a couple years, $10 million ran through my hands. I squandered so much money. I wasted so much money. I praise the Lord I don't have to mess with that anymore. That was God's mercy. I'm telling you, it was God's mercy. I'm glad I have just my little to mess with. It's enough for me to, to handle anyway. Amen? Amen? I want to make sure that you know this is not a sermon against money. It's the love of money. And it's the root of all evil. It doesn't say some evil. It says it's the root of all evil, the love of money. And brothers and sisters, that is our problem here in the United States. We have been trained since children, maybe in, in other countries as well. I know a lot of you guys viewed the United States as a kid. I know one, one person was telling me they thought that the streets were paved with gold, that you show up in America and they just go to the bank and people just start handing you money. They really, they, they grew, as a kid, they come over here and they thought that's how it was in the United States. United States is not the promised land, amen? And you guys, when you got here, you figured it out pretty quick, right? And every passing day, unfortunately, this great nation is lowering standards and lowering standards and lowering standards. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't buy into what is being preached to us, shown to us on TV, the billboards, media, everything. Uh, You've got to look out for number one. It's all about you and what you get. Keeping up with the Joneses, brothers and sisters, it's all going to burn. The question is, are you going to burn with it? Let's go back to Matthew 25, and we're going to pick it back up with verse 34 through 41. God's given us opportunity today. If we have made money our God, if we have put it over Him, it's time to reevaluate our life, try to reevaluate what's important to us. Amen? Amen? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Matthew 25, we're picking it back up with verse 34. It says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, talking to the sheep, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he goes on to say, who are these sheep? He goes on to tell us. He says, for I was hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Looking at this through the lens of 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. Verse 34, verse 35, excuse me. I was hungry and thirsty. God is not only talking about the physical condition here. He is talking also about the spiritual condition. It's not, we don't preach the social gospel here in the Seventh day Amish church. Yes, we are to help people, but the ultimate goal is to help them physically, to help them spiritually, amen? To they, so they can sit at the right hand as well, on the throne as well, in the kingdom, amen? amen? This is not a social gospel message. If someone's hungry and thirsty, they're hungering and thirsty for the word, for Jesus Christ. And those that give it to those people that are hungering and thirsty are those sheep that will sit on the right hand side. Amen. Amen. I was a stranger. I was naked. I was sick. I was in prison. I know we got a brother here doing a prison ministry. Praise the Lord for that. We need to get involved. These all not only have just physical connotations, they have spiritual connotations as well. A stranger to the truth. Naked without the robe of righteousness. Sick because of sin. And in prison 
imprisoned to our temptations, imprisoned to our addictions, as well as the physical. You have to look at this in a physical and spiritual way. Amen. He moves on in verse 37. It says, Then the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we sick, we thee sick, or in prison and came unto thee? They're clues. The sheep. When did we do this? When, we, when, when did we do this for you? That's a mark of a true humble person. They have no clue they're doing God's will for him. It's just become natural for them. Is that our natural tendency for each one of us? Is it natural for us to feed the hungry, to take in the stranger, to clothe the naked, to heal the sick, to visit the one in prison? It can be. And it starts with prayer today. Lord, help me. This is what I want to be. I want to be one of those on the right-hand side. Amen? I want to live forever with you in your kingdom. I want to sit on the throne with you. But I know, Lord, there's things I need to change in my life to get there. Please help me. And God is faithful. He will each and every time. He goes on to say in verse 40, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Every time you reach out to teach someone about Jesus, to share a track, to share a great controversy, to give someone a meal, to visit people in prison, you are doing it for Christ. Because His ultimate goal He wants in 2 Peter 3, 9, that none should perish. Amen? He wants all in the kingdom and He's asking us to work with Him to bring all that was willing to come into the kingdom. And this is a way we can do that. And I remind you, time is short. We need to be doing it now. There's going to come a time, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be rich men bring their billions of dollars and lay at the feet of a Christian and say, here, use it, use it, use it for the work. And guess what? It's going to be too late. And it's going to happen with some of us that just have tens and twenties and thousands. We're hoarding it in our pockets. We're hoarding it in our bank accounts. We're not using it to move forward the kingdom. And there's going to come a time that God says, okay, it's too late. It's worthless. It will burn. And at that point, you with it. It's that real. It's that real. But it doesn't have to be us. Amen? This is, we should be rejoicing with this message. Thank you, Lord. I have been straying. I've been wrong. I've been doing this the wrong way. Thank you for waking me up today. Sometimes we feel like His blessings are a curse to us. And His blessings from the Word. It's showing us, right? This is not, it's not me. It's right here. It's in the Word. Amen? Now we look at 41. We're going to get off on just a... We're doing good on time. 41 again, it says, Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And I tell you, hellfire is not prepared for one human individual. It was never prepared for a human. It's been prepared for the devil and his angels. The only reason a human will be in that fire is because of their own choice. Because of their choices they're making today, right here and now. When that time comes, there will be not an excuse for any one of us. 
We are told all knees shall bow before the Lord and say he is righteous. We will know the reason that we did not make it was because of our own doing and our own decisions. What say you? What is your decision today? But you see in verse 41 here, it says, Then he shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed. Where have you heard cursed over and over and again from the pulpit? Scripture? Anybody got... It's okay. I'm going to read it anyway. Malachi, verse 3, 8 and 9. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? He says, in tithes and offerings. And goes on to say in verse 9, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Put two and two together. The first thing you need to do with your money is take care of God first. Amen? Otherwise, it's plain and simple. If you don't, you are cursed with a curse. And we saw in Matthew, those who are cursed are going to be thrown into the fire. And destroyed. And I'm telling you, the love of money... The love of money is what's holding you back for giving back to God what's His. Don't fool yourself that there's any other reason. And the love of money can be held by the richest and the poorest. We know even the poorest can give something back. Jesus gave us an example by the widow's might. Amen? And He said, with her little mites, she gave more than all those rich people that gave in. Raid your couch cushions. There's probably some change in there. And God will multiply it. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and His righteousness, and all this will be added unto you. It's a promise that you can take to the bank. So he who loves money, I tell you, is breaking the first commandment, is putting a God before God. He's breaking the eight one as well because it says he robs God, right? Thou shalt not steal. The ultimate theft is from God, is against God. So it says it's a serious thing to embezzle the Lord's goods, to practice robbery towards God. The last great day will reveal to them, to the whole universe, what good might have been done had they not followed their selfish inclinations and thus robbed God in tithes and offerings. But instead of doing this, they expended it upon themselves and their children and seemed to feel afraid that the Lord would get any of their money. And thus, they met with eternal loss. To defraud God is the greatest crime of which man can be guilty. And yet this sin is deep and widespread. Yes, today, here in the United States, there it is. By the way, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I'm going to put this out there because there's some people confused on this. And if you want to understand it completely, I'll give you a biblical study. I have some elders give you a biblical study. As a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, there is only one true storehouse. God is not a God of confusion. God is a God of organization. You see it throughout from Genesis to Revelation. He makes no exception with his tithes and offerings. The love of money not just keeps people from giving God back to His in tithes and offerings, but towards benevolence. Benevolence towards our fellow men. And I got to point something, I got to say something, and we're going to keep it vague. There was a man showed up at this church last week looking for help. And someone dealt with, with him in a wrong way. And someone after that came up to the man that was looking for food for his family and tried to rectify it. This guy that came looking for help. And you know what the guy told the guy that wanted to help him? He said, no, thank you. I don't want your help. If this is the kind of people that's in this church, 
I don't want your help. And he walked away. Shameful. Is that what we want people to think of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? No. I'll tell you what, we got enough enemies already. Amen? We don't need to add to them. Because you know what? When someone asks that man, what do you know about Seventh-day Adventist Church? Oh, I showed up one time and needed a little help. They turned me away in a rude way. Going to be one of our biggest enemies. I've been reading the book. Anybody read the book, Carl Wilkins? The book, I, I Will Not Leave. That he, that when he was here, he gave us a book. The Last American That Stayed in Rwanda to Help Out. Throughout that book, he says, because of Adra, because of their benevolence towards the people, his life and the life of the Tutsi people that were with him that he was protecting were saved over and over again because their history of benevolence. The killers, the killers that would kill someone right here would turn to him and his also Tutsi people that were with him and say, let them pass, even though they just killed the same type person. Let them pass because, oh yes, this is a killer, a cold-blooded killer. I know, Adra, you're good to our people. You're good to the children. Pass. We're going to need that. We are entering crazy times in this world. We're going to need that help. Now's the time to start investing in helping those people. Not only that, not for yourself. Don't just look for yourself. The thing is, we need to invest to bring them to the kingdom. Amen? We want that guy when he shows up and says, Yes, the Seventh-day Adventist church was good to me. I want to know more about these people. Oh, if they're good in that, I want to know what else they have. That's the goal. Amen? Yes, there's going to be people that come and defraud you. It happens. There's crooks. There's... You know what? They're coming because they have a love of money. Amen? And they'll defraud you. But don't worry about that so much. And the best thing to do is to pray about it and let God guide you. And you have a church. You have leaders. You have elders. You have a pastor. You have community service that you can come to and say this person needs help. As a matter of fact, please, from now on, let's avoid what happened last week. If someone, both outside or inside the church, you know needs help. Comes to you and needs help. Come see me. Come see someone from community service. Come see Elder Steve. Amen? Then we won't have to worry about that. And we also won't have to worry about people taking advantage of other people. And unfortunately it does happen from both outside the church and inside the church. But this is a way to do it to make it simple. Amen? We want to help and we can help. We have to help. Guys, the love of money is what's keeping us from doing what we need to do. The love of money is what's keeping, is a big reason what's keeping the gospel from moving powerfully here in the United States. You go to South America where people don't have anything. You go to Africa where there's a lot of people who don't have anything. Look at their baptisms and look at ours. Both of them for last year were over 200,000. And we have a little 39,000. And most of those, honestly, in some of our churches that are... They're the children in the church. They're not people from the outside. Amen? We got a work to do, amen? In our own hearts, amen? I'm not going to look to you and say, Hey, brother, hey, sister, you need to... Straighten it up. No, 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 no. That's not your job to do. Hey, brother, what do I need to do? Lord, what do I need to do? What changes do I need to make? Where can I help the cause more? Lord, take away this love for money I have. Take away this pride in self that I have to take care of myself first and not look to help others. We have plenty of opportunities coming up here at Houston International. We are currently working on a community center. This is not going to be just some recreational community center. First and foremost, we want it to be a cheap, not cheap, inexpensive or low cost or free health clinic. Cheap is probably the wrong word. 
We are told that the medical work is the right arm of the gospel. And the work will be finished primarily through this. We have a work to do. We have an opportunity. We have just been given... Joy has been given some extra help as a new YET director. Let's get our kids trained up to get out there and serve the people. Because when you serve, you grow in your relationship to Jesus Christ. You grow in your relationship to Jesus Christ much more than sitting and listening to a sermon when you serve. It's a fact. We have an opportunity. We've, been, we've got over 10,000 great controversies out this year. Praise the Lord for that. But Houston don't have 12,000 people in it. Give to that. That's the truth. That's that hunger, what they're hungering after, they're thirsting after. Give to the great controversy handout. And we can go out each week. We can do that. Our youth can go out. There's opportunities. Are we going to grab a hold of what the opportunities are here? The community service team, they're working on a lot of things. They want to really get us involved in the community. They want this community to say, hey, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is here and we appreciate them being here because what they do for us. Go ahead, ask today. Ask someone about Seventh-day Adventist Church and just go as far as the bus stop. They probably won't even know this is a Seventh-day Adventist Church, even though the sign's right there. We are not making the impact that we need to for the kingdom yet. But again, time is short. And we need to start now. Amen. I, think, I think we've had enough. Amen? Amen. I don't think I can add to it. I think, I think it's, it's there. I'm going to give you two, two sets of scriptures, though. Please, let's contemplate what the Lord has did for us today. What he's done in our lives. The blessings he has given each one of us. I don't care if you are extremely wealthy. Or poor on American standards. I tell you. If you're poor on American standards. In a third world country. You're a rich man. Keep that in mind. Matthew 6. 19 through 21. Take these two sets of scriptures. And pray over them. This afternoon. It says, Lay not yourself up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break, though nor steal. 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen? Amen. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19. This comes after the love of money being the root of all evil. It says, charge them that are rich in this world. That's us Americans, by the way. Even if you're not legally a citizen, if you're in the United States, you're rich in the world standards. Charge them are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Again, verse 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. I'll say that again. Laying up for them in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. And that's just right around the corner. That they may lay hold of eternal life. Amen? Beware, your God may destroy you. Who is your God? Who is your true God? Which are you investing in? We have eternity that goes on and on forever and ever and ever. A million years is a drop in the bucket in eternity. Amen? Forever with Jesus. Are you investing in forever with Jesus? Or your life here, as you see, it's a little dot compared to eternity. Amen? Amen? Maybe a hundred years. And that's not a hundred years of quality life either. And what you get is definitely eternal destruction. The decision is always yours alone. The clock is ticking. Jesus is coming soon. What are you going to do with the information today that God gave you? I know i got changes to make. And I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be on my knees this afternoon and the rest of the week say, Lord, how can I make those changes? Amen?
Let's all stand with the closing hymn number 430, Joy by and by. Let's all sing to our master. Oh.